who've been working in different rooms all, all morning. that done. What do you think I'm doing wrong here? All day, the clickers. Yeah. I, I thought it would, yeah, it does think. Yeah, I don't know. I can ask you to progress, right? And then I just yeah. yeah, if you don't mind, but it's only five slides, I think. It's not going to be a very intense, quickly, like Kathleen's talk. Did you look at the keynote speaking? Uh, which would have been like <laughs> animations and additions and things popping up. Yeah, in that work. <laughs> so all but one of our tigers, huh? The what? All but one of our tigers. Uh, oh, it's all more than one. It's not a tiger. No, it's a, it is some stuff. No, it's just one more than one. Yes, he was in our program and now he's the student of the engagement program. Um, 
George Washington. Yes. Is it anyone else that is representing the United States Congress? Only the man who uh, he gave black. Oh, he needed uh -huh. the whole team with math to do it. No, he was the big PhD program, but he transferred um, mm -hmm. to another program to continue to um, study. He got that college because of that. Oh, he did. Okay. <laughs> So we know him very well. Yeah, we can advocate for any policy change we want. Yeah. That's why I got confused. I'm like, wait, I thought he was a PhD student there. Yes, he was doing his PhD, but as I said, it was an irresistible opportunity for him. Yeah, my memory was for another paper. Okay, and I was like, this is cool. But I got the meeting up with the next slide. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. This is something. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm working on chapter two and one back and forth where I collected it in August. I'm waiting for RFP to be so I'm doing all qualitative and I'm doing photo reflection and photo pattern of these are like big kind of like an interview that you do up. So I will have or I will put up a question and they will reflect what they were thinking about during the presentation and then um Is there any photo ones? No, if I told you that you're photo like photo space and it could be in your house or in New York or somewhere and then so like this part one is like you know I put that thing by right on my face and it is it's an idea of the house for you like so you can kind of buy the picture of that um, and then and the recording papers like this one right here yeah. them and then ultimately the photo bridge project will be the show what I'm doing here like I'm taking it through this yeah. and um, it's so you do a community there so you can have this like community and community and then community and then yeah it's thematic taking the photos and interviewing someone and making it a couple small sessions so you can have but focus there focus group but not the center of our so very instructive which is which not me <laughs> I, I know it's like right it's a job that for me like to do that we bring out some numbers and it's just you know I and I'm not RT and I want to use my stuff to help me to help me to work on it oh so you chose to do that yeah or chose our program we do that I believe we do that every yeah and I did the sign one for him Yeah. yeah, so one of um, chapter two is a uh, social media, and I'm trying to find out if there's a time for like maybe have like three chapters and you sort of like just organic it and not a mixture of other stuff. And it's been very difficult to find that time for that. So then I'm like, I think I'm going to go that angle. I told you here, I was like, yeah, maybe I can do maybe something mm -hmm. here and then go off all the way to something else. Yeah. Well, I'm just going to Which is a little bit in the middle because I think I'm going to go back to the same paper and then I'll go through the same paper that I have. Yeah. 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 So it seems like it's growing. It's like the 1970s, it's like very strong. 
Yeah. Oh, you both were. And then at some point, we realized we get the right place. And uh, at some point, you realize we should involve them in our discussion. <laughs> no, I was like, where's Kaylee? She was there. <laughs> I should, I should at some point show up, right? <laughs> we were so engrossed in what we were talking about. Uh, I said we are engrossed in what we were talking about. Oh, mm. which I'm sure was right with the cross the curve. No, it wasn't. <laughs> the it wasn't. <laughs> and for Kinder Lighting, shall no, we tell yeah. a success story? Did you ever I wrote see? back. I wrote back. <laughs> I didn't want to get called out again. <laughs> Sleep like this, so I think we can sleep so better. It's so no, nice. No, no. Yeah. Do we have anybody logged into Zoom by any chance? We're going to have another um, yeah, presenter. presenter that she was supposed to be logged in. Chris, are you, do you have the Roma? Roma? Yeah. Do you plus him? Um, the 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 Here. We're having to come like on lock. You got got the Zoom um, Zoom session. Zoom Zoom session, right? That's how we can wire the names to the Zoom session. Yeah. Our virtual participants. We are a hybrid roundtable participant presentation, and our virtual participant can come in through Zoom, right? Message. <laughs> never late. Maybe you are having so the coffee guy as well. Issues with uh, technology. Yeah, I'm sure. If I'm the one, you definitely know I'm late or something. Yes. 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 All right, we're going to um, get started. Welcome, everybody. We have our hybrid participant or virtual participant logging in from Washington, D.C. And I don't know if um, he has technology issues, but we're going to be keeping our eyes out for him. He's uh, being messaged. Um, hopefully, it's going to work out. Um, we are um, a roundtable discussion at, at this conference. We are first time participants in the IVAC conference, and we are super excited to be taking part in this uh, um, historical event. We learn the history of, of, of this um, conference as we are listening to keynote speakers and presenters. And those of you who have been um, listening to Art and Yancy talking about the section of their experiences that connects them to Clemson, uh, you kind of hear about our history because we are uh, representing the Peer Center uh, at Clemson University, uh, one of the initiatives of this center that's been in existence for a number of decades and has gone through several iterations in how it participates in the writing across. Uh, and writing in the discipline uh, programs. 
um, and we decided to be giving you um, a little casual after lunch over the dynamic roundtable discussion, which we hope is going to be more of a conversation than really us presenting. Uh, it's going to be definitely a conversation amongst us, the way we designed how we approach uh, talking about our program to you, but also we invite you to at any time if you have a question, um, kind of just raise your hands and ask as the conversation flows. Uh, so the uh, dynamics is is uh, is very much a free flowing and and communal conversation more than a presentation. Um, our to topic here is, got the title of from WEC through WID to professional practicum, uh, which gives us kind of this uh, vantage point from the present because this is where our present is or our program is at the current moment. It has gone through lots of iterations and organic uh, shaping, but this is where we are right now. We had a three, potentially three semester long program at the Pierce Center, which involves um, TAs, graduate uh, TAs. And that is our not very uh, well uh, color contrasted subtitle. It's called Reflecting on GTA Writing Fellows Professional Development Program. So this professional, develop, professional development program is uh, involving, of course, leadership from uh, the Peer Center. Our director has conceived this program um, in her strategic approach to how we can uh, kind of fold into uh, different or integrate ourselves with different departments. Um, stakeholders are also, or participants are also our uh, uh, graduate TAs. And this is, I think, where we find especially uh, relevant that we are present and we open up the floor for these TAs uh, to, to talk about their experiences. Um, if you read our abstract, we kind of uh, carved out our space from a very historic vantage point. We um, cited research from the early 90s and that was surely for the dramatic effect because that literature complains about how little research is uh, focused on TAs. And I have to say, it's not as dramatically bad as it seems from the vantage point of the 90s. Research has happened. So this is my good news here. And we are going to be talking about that research. So uh, looking at the past, from the past into the present, the picture is quite peachy. It's not as uh, perfect as it should be and could be, but I think small acts like this, when we have a conference where graduate TAs are actually able to speak and share their impressions, is one little um, step towards, towards the ideal situation when all of us are empowered, everybody participating in this movement, what WAC is, that it's not a pedagogy exclusive, it's not a curriculum, it's, it's a social movement. And part of that social movement is being inclusive and being empowering and allowing equitable situations, equitable options for um, students and adjunct mm -hmm. faculty and tenured faculty and program directors alike. And, and uh, this is, we are kind of representing that uh, other end of, par uh, of participation, participants in conferences, the end that's less often folded into the academic conversation. So, um, Let's start now that our um, fourth uh, graduate teaching assistant is also present. Hello, Stone, we are so glad to see you. Let's start with introducing ourselves and I'd like us to get into the introduction slide and I will um, ask you, um, Dara and Reza and Myra Stone uh, to introduce yourselves in this order first and then I'd say a few sentences about how I'm in involved in this program. Let's just do alphabetically. Oh, okay. yeah. my, my name is Olua Dara Bimbade and Dara for short. I am a fifth year PhD candidate in the learning sciences program at Clemson. And um, I was involved in the WAC with, and I'm also like the two time practicum participant from 2020 to 2023. And I'm Reza, I graduated from Clemson School of Computing on December 22 um, and started my role as a postdoc at NYU 
uh, in New York. Um, I also participated in, when, when I was participating in the program, it was just MAC 1, 2, and then uh, the curriculum. And actually, it was Reza who wished for the practicum. So he is the, um, the, the pioneer, the idea guy behind this practicum semester, which again shows you how organic our program is. We are really trying to be responsive to the needs of our students, of our uh, stakeholders. So thanks to him, since then we've had um, nine practicum students, if I'm not mistaken. And um, this is, um, I, I think, a, a lovely opportunity for them to reach and give back to the community, reach out to the community and give back to the community, not only within the university, but also outside of it. And we'll talk about that a little more. Hi, everyone. My name is Myra, and I am a fourth year PhD student in the Parks and Recreation Department here at Clemson. I'm a Westwood Fellow, and I'm a selectee for the practicum for this fall. So excited to see that too. Stone. Oh, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Stone Washington, and um, I'm a, a PhD student in the uh, Public Policy and Public Administration program at uh, George Washington University. And I was uh, recently a, stu a PhD student in the Policy Studies program at Clemson University, where I participated in the uh, WAC, WID, and the uh, Practicum Fellowships. Uh, I participated from uh, January of 2021 through May of 2022 in the three semesters of the uh, writing fellowship program. Thank you. Is this a good enough volume? Should we try to get it a little harder? Right. Yeah. Oh, excellent. So can you say a word so we hear your volume now? Oh, yes. Yes. Can, can you all hear me now? <laughs> Much better. Yes, yeah, this is awesome. Thank you. Okay, should, should I repeat myself again, or uh, I didn't know if anything got through? Okay. I think we gathered it, yeah. And we have a few okay. um, sentences on the slide for you, so we're good, thank you. And so I'm okay. Caitlin Beck, and I'm um, one of the VAC faculty members, uh, and I joined in 2019 uh, this program. And since then, I had um, taught, how many students? I had a number there on my slide, but the closed captioning is stopping me. Eight cohorts, yeah, I remember that. 98, 98 students. I added up for uh, quantitative effects. <laughs> uh, and I mentored several students as well. Now, uh, I am employed at an English faculty by Clemson University. And if you um, want to kind of envision the connection there is that uh, the Pierce Center, which organizes conference, I don't know how much you know about the Pierce Center is an endowment. Uh, that has been in existence since the 90s. And this endowment, this peer center, is connected to the English department, but is not part of the English department. It has its own budget, uh, but its mission is to enhance communication in, on Clemson's campus, uh, in all departments. Uh, so this, was, uh, this, this uh, center is very well positioned to be representing uh, the WEC and the, the WID ambitions. And, us English department faculty who are also uh, trained and qualified uh, to teach these courses and interested through our research in these issues, we are great assets for the peer center. Uh, currently we have, um, this is one of the programs that the peer center uh, administers. We have faculty facing writing fellows program and uh, GTA uh, facing writing fellows program. We are in close collaboration with the with Clemson's Writing Center, which is a separate entity. Um, and we are reporting our director, Cameron Bushnell. Um, she is reporting to the associate, uh, associate provost for Clemson. So you can see what a lovely little independent island we are, which has its benefits and its disadvantages. And we're gonna go a little bit into that to, to see what institutional frameworks, how institutional frameworks work, uh, and also for you to kind of think about in relation to this setup, uh, what the challenges and the advantages to this uh, situation are and how your uh, setups are different from this. Um, so we can um, proceed to the next slide, um, which kind of summarizes um, what the framework for our um, 
discussion is going to be. But before I, we do that, uh, I wanted to kind of give you this overview of how our program has grown. And now that our uh, program director is in the house, I need to uh, greet her as well. Cameron Bushnell is uh, directing the Peer Center and also um, oversees our program. And also uh, is one of the faculty of the teachers, uh, the professors who are engaging with uh, the fellows. Um, as you see on this um, uh, flowchart or, or bar graph and flowchart combo, uh, we started from in 2017. And since then, our number of participants has steadily grown um, because of the endowment setup and because we provide a small stipend to our fellows. Um, we are kind of limited in the scope of our reach. And I think uh, I'm, I'm not uh, wrong saying that we're kind of reaching the uh, limits of our capacities, but it is a good, good problem to have, right? When your uh, program is, is fully utilized or optimized uh, to the conditions. Uh, we started with um, five or what was that in the fall? It looks like maybe four, three, four departments. And as you see, uh, we have exponentially grown that. This is in each semester. So cumulatively, we have engaged about 32 departments on Clemson's campus. Uh, I added up uh, for the sake of interest and also because I wanted to compare to uh, the CRIP uh, survey to see how we relate to, how, uh, to the uh, City University of New York, where they did a very far reaching survey about the effectiveness and the satisfaction of GTAs. So I added up how many of, of these departments are from arts and humanities, and I ended up on five. Um, I ended up on eight for uh, departments that are coming from the College of Engineering. Nine departments are from natural sciences and 10 departments are from social sciences. So knowing what kind of university Clemson is, we are an engineering and science focused university. This is kind of representative of that, but it is a very nice uh, notion to know that our reach is, is uh, this widespread. Um, what I still like to say about our program is that it's a one credit program. Um, we meet with our, um, with our cohorts uh, once a week. And the way we started, um, again, it was a smaller scale uh, program at the beginning, but we, re we interview uh, our participants, students apply to our program and through an interview, we decide whether they are a good fit or not. Uh, they usually do this program during their uh, second half of PhD studies, very often as they are TAing and RAing, which again is an interesting take, I think, on uh, WEC implementation. We are preferring training uh, the, G the GTAs who are actually in classrooms or helping them in their teaching to integrate writing, but we don't assume that writing only happens. Um, in teaching situations, we realize that writing is a form of knowledge making and knowledge transfer. So we kind of uh, um, accept and we kind, we kind of embrace those uh, students who sometimes really independent of their will end up with a research assignment, right? This is something that PhD students can't often uh, decide for themselves. Uh, but in those labs, in those research environments, they are still writing and they are still uh, transferring knowledge through written and uh, verbal communication. So we don't think that they are excluded from uh, pulling the, or uh, reaping the benefits of, of this uh, program. Um, the way uh, the semester has uh, or the semesters are set up or have been set up was kind of integrating the WAC and the WID into uh, into the activities combined. Of course, this reflects that issue between can we def define WEC independent from WID? Can we def divide them? Are they the same? Um, now, what we ended up uh, realizing as time went by uh, is that it serves our students better if we, in the first semester, focus on uh, writing to learn, which is the WAC component, if you will. And this is when they think about critically and metacognitively about what writing means for them and also what it means personally. 
And as we move into the second semester, what we've started doing uh, three semesters ago is we separate out the width uh, and we do and focus on that in the second semester. So that second semester is when we talk about uh, when we are allowing them learning to write in their disciplinary conventions in a cross-disciplinary or interdisciplinary cohort where they can bounce uh, their thinking about how writing happens against each other. This is the semester when they discuss what happens in social sciences as opposed to engineering, what happens in biology as opposed to policy. And this is that I think very fruitful uh, environment in which they can really hone uh, their disciplinary writing skills. And finally, the third semester, thanks to Reza now, is our outreach, our engagement with the community. And that's the practicum, which again is only very select students uh, get to do that. This again uh, continues their um, um, writing enhancement. It allows them to select, select their own projects. This is not something that either Thompson or the Writing Center, or anyone else imposes on them. So there is this uh, level of, of, of active uh, uh, engagement in how they define this semester for themselves, but we ask them to reach not only into their departments at this point, but within the university into other cohorts, other groups, and also outside of the university into some uh, community interests uh, that they could help with. So these unique uh, features, and I've talked about um, our institutional independence, if you will, but these unique features uh, kind of, uh, I think, put our program into a different light. Uh, so I would like to ask first uh, to talk about what you, or you invite you guys to say what you are thinking uh, the unique uh, features bring to this program and how you saw what cohort and the leadership uh, constitution um, um, meant for for you as a participant in the program, and I think Reza, you would you would be talking about yeah. it. Uh, so there is a key difference, at least in my experience and observation, between this program and the traditional courses, or the most most of the courses that I passed in my department. In the Department of Computer Science, the courses revolve around course materials, and so there is either a textbook or lecture slides, and they define where the course is going. But in this kind of type of programs, um, it was not the case. The uh, course materials weren't as such. And uh, what was leading the program was the mentorship and the faculty uh, members or the teachers and the, the students. So the courses would change. Probably I, I assume that the next course are slightly or very different based on who are the students that are in them and who are the faculty uh, mentors that are uh, teaching or uh, guiding those courses. Um, so uh, there are very many things for me, but maybe one of the takes that I uh, can talk about in to answer your question now is the um, the way that it contributes to me seeing or perceiving um, how can I learn new things. Um, in, a, in the when, Before joining the program and when I freshly started my program, I was thinking that I probably can mostly get my feedback from uh, my colleagues in the School of Computing. But then being exposed to a diverse cohort and instructors that didn't have any background in computer science, I realized that no, I can learn something from any resource. And um, the mentors in the program are very resourceful, uh, help me um, and catch this. There was another aspect too, um, which is uh, supporting the students. Um, but most of this learning is also, a lot of it is for TAs as well who teach uh, the students. And there's no official training for TAs to, that, that teach them how to be a TA. Um, I had the luxury of having a mentor supervisor in my department, but not every student has that. And um, yeah, maybe TAs are working for a faculty member who is teaching a course, but they're not necessarily talking about detailed dynamics. Um, and so there are a lot of gaps for especially new TAs who join at school and, and want to help with the class. I'm not reducing uh, FAC programs to a program that fills the gap, but I'm acknowledging that in addition to having its own mission and um, its own agenda, it was also filling the gaps and helping those new TAs to figure out and navigate the route 
um, communicate, communicating with students and um, teaching them uh, about the specific courses. Yeah, I think this teaching aspect, and, and you were a TA through those I was uh, a TA two semesters. Yeah, this, as we know, you know, research has talked about that uh, the, the pedagogical uh, preparation for GTAs, not to mention the writing pedagogy preparation for GTAs is still um, sorely lacking. And I think this is what one of the aspects we try to fill in. And so one of the curricular moves that we have kind of settled on, and we really are committed to doing that is setting up teaching consultations. And by teaching, again, I mean teaching as knowledge transfer. So if somebody is an RA, it's still gonna be, a teach there are gonna be teaching moments in their RA ship when we have to explain how to pipette or I don't know what they're doing in their labs. So we set up teaching consultations one-on-one. -on -one. And I know uh, that our students are very uh, uh, invested in, in their conversation, in those conversations. These are the long-lasting mentorship relationships that build out. So can you speak somebody a little more about these teaching, the value of these teaching consultations? I, I could speak on that one. So kind of to fill what you were saying, Reza, when I started my program, I was a TA of four. There was four of us. We were all TAs for this you know, 300 student classroom. And then the next semester, I was just one TA out of 40 students. So I got a little bit more one-on-one -on -one with the professor that I was shadowing. And at the end of the semester, I thought I was going to be a TA again, but I ended up being an instructor of record. And in a sense, I, would, I felt like I wasn't prepared Yet my record showed, hey, I went from a big, you know, a big group of TAs, one TA, and then I should be ready. But the teaching consultations with WACWID really provided that one-on-one -on -one that if there was something that I wasn't sure about or there was something I wanted to expand on with my students, I was able to have those conversations, that mentorship that maybe my advisor for my program or the classes didn't facilitate. So with the teaching consultations, I think it was spot on to have that for both TAs or in preparation to be an instructor of record. And it was very helpful to build those tools. And I got great reviews from my students and some of the uh, teaching uh, tools that I, get, I gathered from WACWID really facilitated that confidence that I was able to, because I, you know, I went into this just wanting, was feeling very uneasy about teaching how to write when I'm still learning how to write and be a good scholar. So I think teaching consultations was spot on for me. It's great to hear. We followed up the teaching consultations, of course, with reflections. This is, again, when the GTAs reflect in writing on what these teaching consultations uh, meant to them. And the word confidence that Maya just used is, again, something that we are aspiring for. We, we know that uh, confidence grows as our purpose. Yeah. Did you see that question now? Is it okay with you guys? Yes. Yeah. I'm just curious to learn more about the curriculum, the pedagogical support curriculum that you have, or is it more kind of free flowing? It's free flowing. Whatever problem they come up with, they come with to the teaching consultation, that's the problem we are trying to tackle. Of course, we can't give them subject matter uh, expertise, but we can talk about pedagogies or just general foundational pedagogy. We can talk about how writing fil filters into solving that issue or how through writing they can work through uh, problems. And I think, you know, again, the confidence, knowing that there's somebody that uh, they can be talking about this and can think together with about solving this. So the curriculum, we always kind of shape, shift shape compared to the core or relative to the cohort and relative to the issues that the cohort brings to the table. And again, yeah, I, I, <laughs> <laughs> I was I was gonna talk about um, an experience I had in one of the courses I taught and I think Ketman was my mentor and at some point I received um, my midterm assessment from the students and it was awful. And I had to reach out to give me, and she was kind of giving me some advice on what to do with my student. And I kind of implemented it in the class. And at the end of the course, I got some great reviews. So I think the teaching consultations actually did help us, I mean, us, the teaching assistants in the program. Yes. Do you have an additional comment? 
No, I, I just again, I wanted to, I, I wasn't quite understanding your question about to, for the entire program, we do work with staff to be with the uh, But then the practicum is much more peace flowing. I think that's where, where we are in that way. I, I was just wanting to say that there wasn't much traction in the background. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, just to clarify, that has the whole program curriculum is what you were asking about. I was thinking about the teaching consultation, the curriculum element of the teaching. Right. Sorry, I didn't realize we were you were only discussing the practice at that point. But so that's fine. That's okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it's good to have our director here. Yeah, the <laughs> curriculum is actually a uh, scaffolding curriculum. We have uh, three areas that we constantly return to uh, through the first and the second semester. So we are trying to kind of align those three areas that we come at from the WEC uh, uh, angle and then from the WIT angle in the second semester. Um, we are talking about how to read critically um, in general first in the first semester and then how to read critically uh, in the second semester more from this um, disciplinary angle. Um, and, and then the practicum is again the extension on that. But I don't want to um, I think we have a question. Sorry, I yeah. just, because I, I similarly wanted to make sure I understood, because that I'm thinking about like program design and layout. And so when you say first and second semester, are they courses that the fellows are enrolled in for credit as part of the graduate, their graduate studies? Yes. yes. Okay. One credit. Yeah, one one credit. credit hour courses that like lead and classroom of the cohort. Okay. Right. Right. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. <laughs> and one of the activities is the teaching consultation, I see. which has more of that fluid problem oriented um, approach that we we took your question to address. <laughs> so um, we also know that um, the TA and RA development are, are both um, kind of um, achieved through this program. And we know that the fellows as writers also benefit and, and grow in their skills um, as writers. And I'm sure um, Stone, who is actually publishing uh, research on writing equity and who has a lot of his work connected to writing in policy studies can be a great uh, contributor to that topic. Yes, yes, thank you so much, Caitlin. Um, Yes, I think for uh, looking at how this program helped me develop as a TA, I think it was mostly kind of a two-prong approach in terms of allowing uh, me to develop as a writer myself uh, through the first semester of writing across the curriculum. Uh, and, and that relates to the last point of just a fellow's development as a writer in terms of it allowed me to gain essential tools towards learning how to write rhetorically so in, in rhetorical writing, you, you think um, much on a larger, bigger picture for how your writing is being used to kind of effectuate your ideas to your audience. And so rhetorical writing lets you think about like how, what's my target audience, um, what specific genre or mode of writing should I use to convey my ideas to my audience? What's the purpose of my writing? And then also how will my completed writing contribute to my overall discourse community or my my disciplinary area that I, I, I'm in. And so doing participating in the WAC program really helped me learn that uh, essential aspect of writing. And I think that was probably the greatest takeaway that I, I grabbed from my first semester in the program. And, but also I, I think the WAC fellowship was really good in terms of just giving you a, a lot of um, lessons about self-improvement. Uh, it, it really, um, gave me like a good lesson about um, the ins and outs of sentence structure, or proper syntax and word choice. And this was conveyed through our uh, action grammar book by Joanne Fearman. And uh, we, I remember we had to do a lot of kind of guided lessons about uh, just kind of relearning the rules of writing, re-exploring the fundamentals of, of, of proper writing and, and doing so in a way to where we would feel confident as writers and then we can take those lessons that we we learned from the book and help them, I guess, be conveyed to our undergraduate students that rely upon us as graders. And, and so that that that's that's kind of where I was talking about how um, WAC helped me with self improvement 
and then I, I think with the uh, the practicum component of the program I, allowed me to actually convey what I learned to help the undergraduate students that relied upon me for their own writing. And, and so I, I was able to more acutely determine where uh, there were issues or errors with my student writings in terms of their um, weekly blog posts that they would have to submit for my American national government class. Uh, I had to basically grade two sections of 50 students each, um, like a weekly uh, blog post that they would make about a lesson that was brought up in the um, previous class. And uh, doing so, I, I was able to kind of understand, like, group each of my students into certain categories, like really excellent writers, um, good to average writers, and then poor writers. And, and, and from doing that, I was able to kind of cater my advice that I learned from the WAC and WIT programs to basically help them in, improve or, or kind of cater like a, a, a more individual approach to improving that student's writing. So once I gave them advice about how they can improve, I, I wouldn't have to kind of be faced with their same reoccurring problem every week after week after week in terms of the, the, the blog posts that they're submitting. And so that really cut my um, workload in half and, and helped me uh, really kind of convey lessons of improvement to these students that really helped improve their grades and also their um, more l larger assignments like their um, midterm essays that they had to do and also their final exam essays. And um, yeah, and, and, and also the, the practicum element of this program was really important to that because I was able to um, craft a, a writing template that I, I used to um, basically provide a framework for how students should um, craft their midterm and final exam essays using examples on kind of what what to not do and also what to do and, and kind of proven strategies for being a more successful writer. And so I, I think just that's just some of the ways in which WAC, WID, and Practicum have helped me to develop as a successful TA and also to in, ensure that I had a lot of self-improvement on, my, on myself as a writer. Any questions about program structure and things like that? Yeah. What's the um, ratio of your own, focus on your own development as a writer to having a full development as a writer to start? I can't say something about that. And I'll use my experience in the class to answer your question. And uh, in my field, which is learning sciences, I uh, we do more of creating learning content. And if you know anything about that is, uh, we focus more on the process and the end product. So when I teach my students, what I'm looking for is how they design their digital content, right? I sometimes tell them to send in their, um, uh, the process they, I mean, go through and they scribble some things you shorthand or even create some mind maps or concept maps or uh, draw because I want them to be able to express their creative self, right? And when I participated in the first semester, I think it's the WAC program, I tried to incorporate writing into the way I teach them. And what I did was that I told them to write out their scripts. And in doing that, I wanted them to be able to write out something that is coherent, something that is like, it's in sequence. You don't just write something for me and then you uh, say that you've written your script. So mm -hmm. they write out their script, they tell me their story story right, storytelling techniques. And what we did with that also was to create like a collaborative document. And I gave them the choice of picking the collaborative document that they can use. Some of them use Google Doc and other wiki platforms, anyone that they are comfortable with. And we went back and forth with their scripts, um, focusing on what they are writing, the structure, the grammar, the lexis, and whatever that we were taught in the program. And I made sure that they wrote well before they even uh, proceed to creating their digital content. So that was like an artifact for them. 
the script that they wrote itself and learning how to use some collaborative platforms like Wiki and Google Doc and all the likes was something that they took out from that experience as a skill. So I think um, uh, other than focusing on the product or the digital content that they would create at the end of the day, which to, to be honest, that was what I was really interested in anytime I teach them. Now they are focused more, or let me say they are um, also invested in the process, especially from the writing stage to the time that they create their digital content. So that I think it's more or less like a model I've used uh, from the time I participated in the program and my teaching with uh, right now. I also did not put anything about writing in the rubrics that I used. But now I kind of put some things in the rubric that if you don't write correctly, uh, it reduces your point or something. So that was like something I did. Yeah, I was actually going to go to that because I, I'm, I myself, I'm of course a multilingual speaker and I also struggle with writing sometimes. So it also helped me reading my student work and correcting it makes me to also go to research, look look at the notes and text that we that we use in the program to know whether I'm doing the right thing and then correcting them. Because I don't want to go to class and the students say, no, this is this is not right, right? So I want them to be sure before I correct them. So that that in itself is sort of self-developmental. Because teachers are lifelong students or life wide students, and I think we're in a really good position to shed light from the non native speaker perspective on how language is a construct and how global English exists in the world. And I think that level of empowerment when we are looking at English from an outsider perspective, and we go through those discussions when our students tell them that's not how it's done, and we say that's what textbooks say that's how the English syntax should be working. However, you know, language is a dynamic form that reflects the change of society and you know rules erode and new rules come to life and uh, this this kind of a, a non-prescriptive grammar that we are kind of representing in real life and they have real experience with that is an, an, an enhancement I would say to having uh, GTAs that are conscious of functioning language and, and writing. Um, so I think, you know, these two things go hand in hand. Um, and I, what I would like to do next is kind of use research from the WAC literature uh, to frame how we reflect about the program. So if you would progress to the next slide, um, I could introduce you, uh, or I could like outline five um, main, um, uh, axes, if you will, uh, in a five-dimensional universe along which we are going to be looking at um, the value of our program. And uh, one of the uh, studies that I found extremely uh, useful and very current, right, compared to uh, how TA participation in WEC um, uh, with the back movement is was so understudied by now there have been several uh, research articles published um, Tanya Rodriguez great dissertation was one of the groundbreaking um, summaries and overviews of how this literature evolved and I uh, through uh, the WAG journal I um, found this excellent study by Elizabeth Miller and Kathleen Lisey uh, that was basically looking at how this long lasting positive experience from a short term commitment, the power of WAC TA fellow role uh, in this disciplinary TAs was just talking to me. Ours is a very short time commitment, relatively short time, right? The one credit course. But then the long lasting positive uh, aspects is what we would like to uh, focus on. Hopefully there are not many traumatic negative experiences coming out from the, our program. Um, and I would like to invite our TAs now to address a little bit about how they would be um, refining um, or how they refined what they understood to be teaching and knowledge transfer, uh, how creating writing assignment uh, sources or other resources uh, help them in their future, how 
uh, the teaching community, participating in a co teaching community impacted them, how their confidence increased, and Maya kind of um, hinted on that already, and, and then how if they are in a faculty position or planning to be in a faculty role, how that our program uh, prepared them for, for these. Uh, the other literature that I forgot to mention at this point is this uh, Vincent Reed article from 2016, which has this concept of liminal position that TAs are taking, how they're brokering between faculty role and student role and how this border crossing is happening. Uh, and they, I'm, I'm hoping that our uh, TAs will be able to shed light um, in an authentic way on that as well. So um, let's, let's start with one, right? How your understanding of uh, teaching uh, change, maybe how your enthusiasm has changed thanks to our um, teaching or uh, the mentoring that you've been receiving. Um, and most and, and importantly, I'd like, and kind of Dara hinted on that already, I'd like to hear about what conversations, the conversations we had about social justice aspects of writing pedagogy. Uh, we read articles about um, anti-racist writing pedagogies and how that uh, impacted them. So would you be ready to talk about that? Yeah, uh, Dara? yeah absolutely. So um, I, we had a text, I think it was in the uh, weed semester, the second semester, that talked about uh, writing in social justice. And I think I also uh, participated in a course uh, called Equity in STEM. And it was, I think at that time that I was trying to prepare for one of my courses, I think is a STEAM assessment, no, it wasn't, but it was the Digital and Media and Learning course. So what I, uh, some of the things I kind of learned from all the interactions that we had then was the value in critiquing and feedback and respect for, for culture, for language, for even tone in which you express yourself. And in knowing all of that, I kind of incorporate some of those things into in, into my teaching and I made sure that my students actually have a text on um, anti-racist um, um, pedagogy. And there's this book that we took an extract from. We read some part of the book and we critique and reflect on it in class is a book by Sophia Noble, um, pedagogy, no, it's the um, algorithm of the oppressed. And we kind of kept like a reflective journal throughout the class to do some critiquing. So after the class, we had some feedback. I had some feedback from the student concerning some of the things that we talked about in class. Though all the classes, not all of them were actually on that topic, but they kept this journal that was part of what they discussed after the course. So I would say that that in itself brought about some consciousness in them, in their writing, especially when it comes to equity and social justice. And many of them were able to really express themselves. That was a time I had an heated argument with a kid, so a, 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 someone in the class. And I would say that I allowed that because I wanted him to express himself, to talk about what exactly he feels about the topic. And that was how I uh, prepared or I kind of created the learning environment in my class to be democratic enough for everybody to express themselves. And it was predicated on some of these things that we discussed in our writing class. And I think that reading also is a critical part of writing and they read those texts, they reflected on them, and they write it in the class throughout the whole uh, period of time that we, uh, that we were together. So you are gonna be, um, you're hoping to be, you know, continuing your career in a teaching capacity, right? If the money is good. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's that's me be honest. Best money ever. I don't oh, do not be a software developer. Not for this. Well, I know that uh, uh, 
oh, I thought Stone was about to say something. I know that um, part, part of the uh, activities are resulting in resources that they will be using, especially in a teaching capacity. But as I've mentioned, we have lots of tentacles reaching out to other um, uh, constituencies at the university. We are connected with the writing center. Uh, we are connected with the library. We are connected with the graduate school. So we do uh, lots of projects that benefit or, or create lasting artifacts that they can use. So they benefit from uh, our cohorts activities. So these resources uh, may include something like a writing clinic. It's one of the, it's a kind of canned video presentation that our students create that then the writing center could use for people that ask for help with different disciplinary issues. If, they, if we happen to create one video, 10 minute video clinic for them, they can use that as an asynchronous uh, delivery method. We have created and reworked assignments that uh, can stay with the department and other TAs can be using. We have revised rubrics that again is a lasting uh, resource. Um, and I, I would like Myra to talk a little bit about one of the experiences uh, or some experiences that Great she has resources. heard about yeah. the resources, yeah. So like I mentioned earlier, I went from being a small little fish to then like the big fish in charge. And every time, and I actually had two classes that I was an instructor of record alone. And one of my classes was 40 students and each of those classes were different topics. So I mentioned I was in the parks and recreation or I am in the parks and recreation department. And one class was designing a park. So my students had to do a group project of designing a park. And the second one was professional development. And each of them, I was able to implement a writing assignment um, designed differently, but still to get after that goal is, which is just practice writing. And professionally at the same time, I was also building my own checklist of when I edit and revise my own work. So I think in the classroom from what I remember, I know it was a semester ago, I was able to have those discussions with my cohort and my peers of, if I'm presenting an assignment to my students, what's missing or what am I not explaining that may or may not make sense or what can I add, what can I remove? And after I went through that process and used that material in my own classroom, I just saw like a positive outcome and positive review for my students. I remember, I think with Cameron in our first semester, I'd shared that I did the five minute writing in the classroom. She gave us that assignment and she's like, take out a piece of paper and for five minutes, just write. And if you get stuck, just keep writing or put dot, 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 and keep writing. And when I did that with my students for designing the park, one of my kids was like, wow, I didn't know that I was gonna be able to build my outline for my paper in five minutes, even if it was the first draft of the outline. But I, I had that reaction, my students had that reaction, and overall I'm able to have that those templates and those resources to be able to, or toolkit that I'm able to dive back in once I leave Lockwood and the practicum. So kudos to the resources. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, then we are we are in this community, and, and part of this community is to kind of um, have this collective effort towards certain writing goals or pedagogical goals, but also to be able to see differences. So, Reza, can you talk about a little bit how you understand or how this program helped you understand uh, what differences exist between writing in different disciplinary contexts? Yeah, definitely. Um, so. A very good advantage of the program was the interdisciplinary aspect. It wouldn't definitely be as beneficial if all of my cohort come from my department. It's interesting to see um, the practices in different departments and uh, maybe the lenses that they see uh, the research and the teaching through. Um, for example, in my discipline, there's a lot of quantitative research going on, or a lot of quantitative classes. In the School of Communication, there's a lot of qualitative uh, research going on. So um, in some of the classes that I have some qualitative aspect to, to it, I can learn about the qualitative practices uh, from those more qual heavy um, disciplines. And um, that was something that was happening for me. Uh, for example, um, how do you grade a qualitative text is a big, was a big question for me because I was used to grading quantitative questions.
questions. Okay, there's a solution um, and there's a final answer, and that's clear for me how to grade it. But it's hard to grade that piece of text, and um, that was something that we had uh, as an assignment too, um, and I learned about it from uh, my peers from other disciplines. Uh, how to what, what are the steps that you can take in order to grade um, a qualitative uh, text? And the other side of it is also okay, how different disciplines um, write. And there is usually a focal point in different disciplines that they pay attention to. For example, in my, my HCI research in the School of Computing, application of it is very important. So when you write a paper, you focus a lot on the application. You present the paragraphs and the text in a way that it leads to the reader understanding, OK, that I know, now I understand why is this useful. Now, if you are doing IS, information system, instead of application, the main focus is on the theory. So they are looking for your theoretical lens and what does your result or your work mean for the theory. If you are publishing the same research in the psychology, then the shift is on, or the focus is on the individual and the personalities that, okay, what does it mean for these types of personality traits? Um, so I think the message that um, each field is communicating and the lens that they are seeing through um, is very important and it can spread out through the future career as well and how to communicate with your audience. Uh, but that was an interesting aspect that the interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary aspect of the course uh, could help me see the different ways that different people from different disciplines see the world. And, um, contribute to their field or their literature. Uh, I have something to also build on that because I remember that, well, I think I appreciated the, the pragmatic approach to learning how to write from the way we kind of wrote an abstract one time because it was a, we were told to identify a conference that would like to go or that is, that is in our discipline. And we chose the, the conference, we wrote the abstract, we had um, our fellow students, our peers to critique. And these are folks that are not in, that are not in my discipline, that are not in learning sciences. And it, it was really um, practical for me. And also I, was, I guess I was able to present my work to someone that is not in my field. And if I'm able to do that and they understand what I'm saying, I guess anybody can read my work and they would understand. So it was it was something that I really liked about the about the program, being able to um, you know, have people from just different di disciplines to read my work, critique it in a very constructive way that is. And those critics are sometimes surprising to you because yeah. you are in a certain discipline, you never had thought about it that way. And then you were like, oh, oh yeah, yeah, that's true too. I can see it that way too. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Because you 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 don't see see everything when you write. And then when you see those critiques, you'll be like, oh my goodness, like I wasn't even looking at, it, looking at it from this point of view. So, And most of the time you incorporate it in what you write and what you write actually like really nice. <laughs> oh, and yes, I, I just want to um to chime in. I, I think uh, both Reza and Dara, what you were saying is, is very, very excellent. And I it really also resonated with me because I, I, I when preparing for this conference, I really thought a lot about the conference abstract assignment that we had in the writing in the disciplines semester, which was my sem second semester in the program. And yeah, I, I feel like I, I really liked how um, learning about the just the, the general framework of an abstract for graduate students, it allowed me to kind of weigh the, the differences in terms of like what I have in common um, as a, me as a uh, public policy student in the social sciences realm, what I have in common in my abstract writing with somebody in like a hard sciences field like biology or chemistry. 
uh, and, and and seeing that I, when writing an abstract, you actually, I, I was able to pick, pick out a lot of things that we have in terms of similarities, in terms of the general uh, structure, the, the word count, what an abstract is used for. Um, it, it was really interesting. It, it also allowed me to kind of think about the overall importance of an abstract, um, an abstract being just kind of like a, um, a, 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 a small, concise roadmap as to what your research paper is going to be conveying and also ultimately what the purpose of your research is. It, it's, it's just a good way of just defining that in um, just a, maybe six to seven sentences, 250 to 500 words. Uh, and and it, it was it was really, really nice. And then I also liked how um, writing in the disciplines allows you to think about the relative differences that you have across different uh, areas and different fields. And I, I learned that like um, some students may have to focus more attention on incorporating like their research methodology in their abstract or maybe have like a certain statement of purpose that's presented at a certain part of their abstract that's required by um, their discourse community. So like their the, the professors in that field have like a certain set of expectations that they have to adhere to uh, that that might be certain in that field, but also it might be different for another uh, field like in social sciences. And so I, I thought that was really interesting and, and just seeing like how certain abstracts can vary in terms of length, what's included. Some might be more qualitative oriented, but some might be more quantitative focus in terms of describing your, your, your methods, your um, data, the findings that you have made and um, stuff of that nature. And it, it was really interesting to kind of just think about the relative differences. And um, so, yeah, that, I think that that assignment really stuck out to me as well. Yeah, Miller and Weiss, they also uh, uh, question their subjects. Um, they do the survey and interview, and they also ask the subjects. So, do you think is this something this teaching community is this something that you would that you would aspire to seek out in your future in your career? So, let me pose this very <laughs> provocative question to our participants. Now that you've been in a community where writing was at the center, and I think the the way they talk, the language they use to talk about writing, kind of is a testament to how they understand the writing process. But is this something that you would see yourself seeking out in your future? Do you think these domain transfers could be relevant for you in your future professional career as well? Yes, yes, <laughs> I was like, yes. I actually, what, part of my cohort was, what was Kandani's name like? What was the name? Abhishek? Yes, um, Abhishek? sorry. Abhishek. Have some cool names. Yes. yes, Abhishek and I started together, and he is from physics, I believe, mm -hmm. and I am from parts and recreation, behavioral science, and we speak different languages, and he is someone that I, I stay in touch with and kind of build that writing community where I can reach out to him, and we just have a conversation about things that we're trying to build, even if it's an assignment or if it's our own scholarly work, we're trying to kind of unfold before we take it back to our own department. So, and he's also talked about building that community in, in physics, they writing isn't their main effort in a sense. And he talked about how he brought that back to the other TAs in his department. But yeah, we seek to continue to build that, that community and hopefully stay, stays with us um, in our career. And this is one of those ripple effects, right? That we, we Weiss and Reed is talking about and the border crossing allows these ripple effects to kind of uh, yeah. reach out. Um, yeah, we think about, a lot of people say that, okay, think outside the box. It's really hard, it takes a lot of effort. One way to uh, make it easier is to work with uh, people from other disciplines like what you are doing with Abhishek. Um, it helps you to think outside the box because you are sitting in your box and now you want to get an outsider with new perspectives maybe to help you design anything. Um, and in myself, I, my goal is to be an academic. And so, uh, yes, if I want to, for example, submit a grant in the future, a lot of the grant officers will be from the program, but then there will be people with uh, maybe different perspectives or um, other grant officers uh, from different disciplines. And um, it's very useful to be able to communicate um, what I want to achieve within the scope of that grant to them and how it can benefit the organization that is granting the grant or the higher social impacts. And 
uh, yeah, having uh, these Brighton communities can help uh, achieve that more and better. It also increases confidence because uh, when I hear from some other people that, okay, what I'm doing is really useful, then I'm more confident in my writing and uh, believe in my uh, goal and objective more. And I think Stone has addressed to your question uh, whether this program helped his own writing and in what proportion it helped his writing. But Stone, uh, would you say a few words about how this program kind of sheds a more positive light on, on TAs or, or RAs, uh, GPAs, basically, in, a, in a, uh, the main specific um, assignment or the main specific teaching position? Oh, yes. Yes, of course. Um, I think in, in terms of, 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 of a TA, uh, I, I know for my first semester in the WAC program, I think most of the people in my cohort were TAs. And in my capacity as, as a TA, I think it really um, helped emphasize the essential roles that TAs play in relation to the, the kind of detracting a lot of the workload burden that's placed on the professors that they're assigned to in a given semester. So at, for my program in, in policy studies, I was assigned to two professors in the political science department. And um, once I was able to kind of incorporate an understanding of writing across curriculum and, and, and kind of self-improving my writing practices, I was able to kind of uh, do what my professor couldn't do in terms of serving as like a, a stopgap for preventing students from making like precarious mistakes in their writing assignments. And, and, and whether that be their uh, weekly blog posts, their midterm essays, or even their final exam papers, um, I was able to, to kind of really focus on a lot of the hidden details that underlined where what, what, what problems they were having in their writing, whether, whether that might be improper word choice, um, faulty sentence structure uh, or, or just not being able to think of a good way to convey their writing or maybe they had issues at the brainstorming process in terms of what to write on. I was able to kind of use use my training from Whack and Wid to do what my professor was probably too busy to do and just kind of serve as like a almost like a consultant for my students to kind of help them improve their writing. Uh, sometimes I would host like impromptu um, office hours where I would just talk about ways that they could best approach how to prepare for their midterm essays. And, and then using the practicum program, I was able to devise a writing template that I um, cleared with the professor of that course. And I was able to kind of meet with students during my, the office hours, talk about like different uh, things to look at when you when you refer to the template before you write your essay and just how to avoid like certain pitfalls and and, and issues that I've seen as like re, on a reoccurring basis from looking at other people's writings. And that really helped, um, it gave me like confidence as a TA to understand like what I'm supposed to do uh, in relation to what my professor does with, the, with, with, with teaching a course and just being able to serve as like that kind of um, a, additional uh, measure of support for helping student writing to improve over time. And uh, I think that's really important. So I think yeah, TAs are it, it just serving as like a a, almost like a writing consultant or a, a, um, a, 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 a extra um, person that's there just to kind of provide help and guidance to students when the professor is probably too busy or is focused on other aspects of the grading. Uh, so that, that really stuck out to me as a TA. I want to highlight something that we are talking about, but I think it deserves a separate discussion that, yeah, there is a lot of support, but the community aspect of it is also relevant. Like that's a conscious choice, I think, for this keyword. Um, a lot of support is at the mechanism level and okay, how to improve the efficiency of this. But then it's also like a social support group for the TAs. Think about TAs that they are getting into college, they have their own coursework, they have a, their own projects to deal with. A lot of them are even from other countries. They are new to, they are, they are new in, in this environment. And so there is a lot going on with them. And the um, cohort can be really like a social support group. And the, the uh, program leadership can be and are mentors to them. So it's a resource that they turn into. And 
besides its practical aspects that it improves, it improves the, um, the outcome and tells them more on how to communicate with students, it also contributes to their well-being and um, it's like a social support group or some resource that they turn into when they uh, feel that they need uh, some help. I can attest to that. We spent three semesters with these students, which is a, especially for undergraduate uh, level instructors, uh, lecturers like me, for example, it's a unique pleasure. And this closeness that we can build with students is, is really rewarding. Um, and I know there should be a, a very systematic uh, outcome, um, sir, uh, outcome research uh, on the relevance and the benefits of this program. And something like uh, Michael Cripps has, had done with Allen Robinson, which was a large scale survey uh, asking students what aspects of the program they appreciated, how it carried on into their future uh, careers. Uh, would be in place, but I'm happy to report that when I systematically went through and I did not use AI, I just read through <laughs> all the um, all the evaluations and reflections. Most of the questions that Crips survey, uh, Crips et al. survey had uh, addressed also surfaced in our evaluations. So if you would progress to the next slide, which will be our closing slide, I lifted out some of these. Uh, key terms uh, from the, the CRIPS survey that also overlap with the language of the reflections uh, and course evaluations. Uh, reflecting critically on writing, writing, this is something that students uh, were uh, addressing in their reflection as the value of this program or the measure for success. Leading effective class discussions. Uh, the second semester with ask students to discuss writing related topics and use a writing assignment in their discussion. Uh, writing effective assignments, we've talked about that, commenting on students' papers, should that be a feedback from the TA or GTA or should that be teaching them how to do peer reviews, evaluating students' writing as grading and as giving formative feedback, helping students become strong writers uh, and helping uh, developing the GTA's own writing and defining the, our professional selves, defining what it means for me to be a learning science uh, uh, professional or a, a you know, policy science uh, uh, professional. So uh, what's unique about us, and I know we are kind of in this luxurious position where we can be a stronghold of WEC, um, the ripple effects uh, that we can generate can reach outside of the university because of this uh, independent um, um, institutional framework that we are embedded in. We are, we can afford to be organic about how we develop our programs um, and that we can embrace TAs and RAs from a variety of domains. These are things that I think every program could benefit from. Um, these are what we think are unique and we feel very fortunate to be participating in. Um, and with that, I'd like to ask you to say, you maybe to reflect on how uh, your programs look, what your takeaways could be, or what other questions you have to our GTAs who are here as a source of information and inspiration for you guys too. Ask a question, but I don't want to fall. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, this is really inspiring. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm really excited about the possibilities of this teaching program at my institution. Um, and I hope I may lastly ask about money and labor. Um, so my first question is of the TAs um, that I asked for this segment Ooh. was, and also can you tell me about what drew you? I mean, what incentivized you to participate in such a program? It seems like an enormous commitment on top of already many other enormous commitments. Um, and uh, then also I'm curious about program administration, like what kind, how does this, um, uh, how were you relieved? How did your teaching go? Yes. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, and and does your does the labor involved kind of adequately reflect the compensation you receive, or is it has it been 
scalable, all the kind of, you know, what's this question? <laughs> what's this school question? I can start. Um, I, what incentivized me was I had, I was a non-thesis master's student and took a gap before pursuing my PhD. So I felt very uneasy about writing again and being in a classroom. And my advisor, uh, she advised to seek out a writing community. And one of my classmates actually brought this up to me. It was like, hey, I was part of this two, or, or two years ago, one of the other PRTM students, you should apply for it, but there's it's a rigorous process. We talked about the interview and I'm like, well, I don't know if I'm gonna get selected, but I took a stab at it, got selected. And that really kind of provided the foundation for being comfortable writing again. Like, like I know I got, I know I got accepted into a PhD program, et cetera, but the confidence was, <laughs> was not fully there in, in regards to just being comfortable with writing. And we used the money or we were advised to use the money for professional development. So I used that to buy books that I need for my dissertation and um, things that really are for data collection and et cetera. And again, my incentive was just being a writing community. I don't know if you guys have. Uh, for me, uh, of course, um, uh, international so I was I was teaching in a different context I got, I was educated in the British system so coming to the US it was like a uh, a whole different you know ball game mentality so I needed um, to ground myself in not only writing but also teaching in the American context and in the system so the WAF and we provided me with the opportunity to do that. I I was enrolled at the time that I was preparing to teach and that really helped me to really prepare myself. I created rubrics at that time. I think I had a, a rubric from my professor. I modified it for, for my own class. I was shadowing her and then for my own class, I changed it, I tweaked it and I used it for my own class. I changed uh, some things in the assignments and homework for my own class that I took from the program. So I, I'll say that it was, you know, getting ready to teach and I was I wanted to be prepared. But of course the money too is there. I didn't use it to buy books, but I <laughs> used it for something <laughs> else. Yeah. I did not spend it on the faculty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And for me, since the beginning of my studies, I knew that I want to be an academic and I'm going to need a lot of writing. Um, now, it's interesting that at the beginning of this program, I didn't know the extent of it. I was thinking that maybe it's, a lot of it is mechanical. It wasn't. Uh, luckily, it wasn't. Um, but that was one of my motivations. Of course, the incentive was also an important parameter. I think there's a small incentive, but it's more the synergy that we try to create for them so it doesn't feel as a enormous undertaking. Maybe it sounded like that because it really turned out to be something that was a win-win. Have their teaching, their research at the same time, it also constituted or it created opportunities for other parts of the university and our community. And for us uh, lecturers who are involved with this, it's a labor of love, of course. We get uh, also salary uh, for a one credit, proportionate for a one credit uh, teaching load. But for us, the huge benefit is that we have access to the TAs that teach the undergrads, which we, whom we teach in large quantities. So for us to see where their writing is coming from, how their writing is shaped, is, is a huge uh, benefit. Uh, that, that's that's what I think most of the gains that the lecturers uh, from business, technical, and science writing who teach in this program are taking away with them. And we are out of time. It was Stone just, has Stone just disappeared? Oh, hi. Oh, are you there? All right. Wonderful. Well, I want to thank everybody and to say what the community is. I mean, Reza drove back to Clemson for this conference. <laughs> Stone is taking time out of his uh, busy time or busy day in DC. So I really appreciate you guys. Uh, participating in this conference and uh, if you have any questions in the future as you're shaping your program um, contact us we have our con uh, contact information in the program and I appreciate your attention and all the research that you guys are doing and helping us with
No, I am actually going to be here for the next session. Are you done?